I'm Jim Paxson with Arizona Game and Fish. And we're here at the Outdoor Expo. Arizona Wildlife Use is brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. Today we'll take you to the Outdoor Expo where you'll see a whole bunch of fantastic ways to get outside and enjoy our great state. All that and more on Arizona Wildlife Use. If you enjoy the outdoors, you'll love Arizona. With so much to see and do, it could take a lifetime to do it all. And if you're not sure where to start, this is the place to be. The Arizona Game and Fish Department's Outdoor Expo is a three-day event that takes place each March at the world-renowned Ben Avery Shooting Facility in Phoenix. It's a greatest hits of outdoor activities. Fishing, hunting, camping, shooting sports, wildlife viewing, boating, and off-highway recreation. What happens all over Arizona is right here at the Expo. You see the big fish? If you take a look at he's got a ring that goes around his face. Well, one of the neatest things that we have here is live wildlife. Last time I came, I got to hold a python. It's amazing stuff. Very good. I was going to say that. Good. Outdoor Expo is fun, family friendly, and free. It's not only free to get in, but it's free to park. We come every year, and since my kids were probably seven, eight years old, now we bring the grandkids. We have a lot of fun. Can you take a picture, Tati? There's loads of hands on activities for people of all ages and levels of experience. Have you shot before? Yes. My first shot, I got a bullseye. They can get target archery instruction and time to test their skills, or discover the best places to go boating and off roading and learn how to stay safe doing both. Shoot an air rifle, shoot a 22. She almost hit a bullseye. Yeah, for her first shot ever. Big kids can shoot big guns. <laughs> Shooting, just trying out all different kinds of guns, seeing which ones we'd like to buy. And this one right here. Expo offers an opportunity to try out the latest firearms right on the range in a safe, controlled environment. We get a lot of uh, guys that have shot their whole life. We get uh, people that have never shot. So we have a, just a wide variety of people. And, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to be able to let them, uh, let them shoot the Rugers. Professional anglers are willing to share some of their secrets. Here, hold it. Can I hold it? Fishy, fishy, fishy. And kids can experience the thrill of catching their first fish at huge catch and release tanks. A great run for the cowgirl. 16199 is the time. 16. Kids also get a kick out of the cowboy mounted shooting. I think they're cool. Horses, guns, and bursting balloons. It's a recipe that seems to capture their imagination. And if all that good fun makes you good and hungry, Expo has you covered. We serve Angus burgers, buffalo burgers, elk burgers. We sell out of buffalo and elk every time we come here. Outdoor Expo draws more than 35,000 visitors making it one of the largest outdoor recreation events in the state. All the major vendors are here like Cabela's and Bass Pro and Sportsman's Warehouse. Introduce, you know, the outdoors to people that have never experienced any type of this stuff to create more memories and lifestyles of enjoying the outdoors. This is a great event to expose folks to the outdoors. We know that from last year, 60% of the people that came had never done anything like camping and fishing and hunting. So this is an important event to get folks involved for the future. What is this track? That's a deer. 
After even one day at Outdoor Expo, kids of all ages will be ready for a lifetime of outdoor adventure. It's really been really fun. We need to keep quiet, but we're going to kind of go off in this direction. Right. Stepping softly, moving slowly. You can never be too quiet when stalking wild game, especially antelope jackrabbits. You think you're being quiet, you're trying to move and it's loud, and these things have giant ears. This is 12-year-old Ian Gawin's first time hunting. His dad, Ray, got to share the experience. He showed an interest in hunting, which I never had, but he does, so we're sharing it together. They're learning from Chris Query, who just spotted one of the crafty critters. It's 75 yards, you wanna try it? So after a long morning spent tracking jacks, their patience pays off and Ian may finally get to take his first shot. He's sitting underneath that branch. We'll catch up with him in a moment, but first let's take a few steps back to see where this hunt began. Tents and trailers in the Alter Valley southwest of Tucson served as central command for the 2013 Junior Jack Camp. It's a free event for kids 10 to 14 years old with little or no hunting experience. This is the fifth year of the jackrabbit hunt. It's been a phenomenal success. We've had Game specialist Jim Heffelfinger, known as Jackrabbit Jim, runs the camp for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. But he gets a whole lot of help from the Arizona chapter of Safari Club International, Sportsman's Warehouse, the National Wild Turkey Federation, and a bunch of volunteers. They finished setting up camp Friday evening before a night of nasty weather. We had uh, a lot of blustery, rainy, kind of windy weather. And then this morning the sun broke, the wind laid down, and rabbits were everywhere. Hoping to shoot something. That's a jackrabbit. I'm going to get five. You could sense the excitement Saturday morning as kids finished their breakfast and started gathering their gear. We've got to be quiet. Chris met with Ian and his dad to plan their hunt. We're going to do the same thing. He's ready for case. All right. And when the first groups of hunters started rolling out of camp, Team Ian wasn't far behind. Get some heat going in the windshield here. We're going to be hunting on state trust land today. To get to their hunting ground, they drive across a private ranch. The owner generously allows folks to pass through his property as long as they register at this game and fish checkpoint. After signing in, they continue on a short journey to their final destination. So we're almost at this one. We get in and look, here's the road. When they arrive, Chris takes time to review some important information. So I have a friend of mine in search and rescue, and he says the opposite of getting lost is staying found. So he shows Ian are, where they are on a map. So you look at the number. It's four, and one, what the six, plan is seven, should they get lost or separated from the others. Head to the road and we'll start driving the roads looking for it, but hopefully that doesn't come to that point. All right, let's get the rifle out. He also goes over some of the fundamentals of firearm safety. Okay. So we're going to walk around with the safety on. Ian hasn't hunted before, but he already knows the basics. All right. To be eligible for the Junior Jack Camp, he and the other campers had to complete a Game and Fish hunter education class. And you're going to dry fire on a target. No ammo. Here are the coyotes. <laughs> cool, huh? <laughs> Follow through, so pull the trigger and leave it pinned to the rear. After Ian demonstrates he's ready to hunt, Good. They set out in search of an antelope jack. Hours into the hunt, Ian still has nothing to show for it. The group spotted several rabbits darting off into the distance, but they were never in range of the rifle. And as Jim says, you know, the number one job for a rabbit is to be food for everything else. So they're good at being elusive. As Ian continues hunting, some kids are already returning to camp with rabbits in hand and pure joy on their faces. Mostly smiles, smiles, smiles all around on everybody. It just seems to be such a fantastic success. And the first little girl, Erica, came back with six rabbits. Have you ever done this well before? Yeah, well, well, not all at once, but last year I got eight, so I'm working on it. <laughs> Every jack is measured and weighed. Eight pounds, three ounces. And they can weigh a lot. Actually, this antelope jackrabbit that we have down here it runs eight to 10 pounds, and, it, and it's not all over the West. It really is a species that's in southeastern Arizona in, in certain soil types in certain areas. So it really is a special jackrabbit. 
See that little thing right here? That's a little baby tick. It's an animal scientists want to know more about. So Game and Fish invited biologists from ASU and the U of A to participate in the camp. We have people collecting stomachs to look at food habits. We have people collecting DNA for two different DNA studies. We have uh, some parasitologists looking at parasites. And then we have um, collecting some long bones and we're looking at aging animals by, by x-raying the, the feet. So there's a lot of science going on here. So we take the leg uh, to measure the recruitment of the rabbits in the, in the population, which is basically how many are new rabbits in a given year versus are adult rabbits. 17 and an 8. After the scientists get what they need, the kids learn how to clean their rabbits, and later they'll even get a taste of jackrabbit stew. That one's done. Junior Jack Camp introduces kids to just about every aspect of hunting. Jackrabbits are the absolute ideal entry-level hunt. They're, they're a small big game animal is what they are. And so we take kids out and it's all the elements of a big game hunt. It's the spotting, it's the stalking, it's getting in a good shooting position. Which brings us back to where we left Ian at the start of this story. He's still waiting to take his first shot when Chris spots a jack about 75 yards away. He's in that vicinity. There's a glimmer of hope that's gone in an instant when the rabbit races out of range and out of sight. We saw 11 rabbits today, so that's that's step one, is know where to find the rabbits and start seeing them. And the next thing is, you know, hopefully get your rifle up on one. <laughs> when you get out there, you will see a lot more running off at 200 yards. They're not, and that's a great thing about taking kids out, is that they're, it's not like shooting a fish in a barrel. You have to use all of your hunting skills and, and really do a good job to be successful. But there, there's enough of them out there and you get enough opportunities that, that sooner or later, most kids are successful at these camps. When Ian returned to camp, he saw just how much success some of the other kids were having. During the weekend, they brought in a total of 103 yeah, antelope jacks, <laughs> averaging just over eight pounds. The heaviest was a whopping 10 pounds, six ounces. Okay, big smile. Ian didn't get a rabbit Saturday morning, but with two more hunts left to go, he wasn't giving up hope. And if it doesn't work out, he says he still had a really good time. It was a lot more fun than I thought it would be. That seemed to be the consensus among the kids and their parents. <laughs> well, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> she gets excited, I get excited. But it's a lot of fun. <laughs> That's all I can say. I enjoyed it. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, for our first hunting trip, it was an excellent way to learn the basics. It was fantastic. Uh, our guide, Chris, did an excellent job. I'm just kind of here to help him show the way and hopefully get him hooked, and I think they already are. If they weren't then, they are now. Ian finally shot his first rabbit, a perfect ending to a wonderful weekend at the 2013 Junior Jack Camp. Have you ever wanted to do something new and adventurous, but you just weren't exactly sure where to start? Well, if you're a woman who wants to spend more time enjoying Arizona's great outdoors, then there's a three-day workshop just for you. It's called Becoming an Outdoors Woman. We just want to get that lady that hangs out in the mall and has never been outside. We want her. The Becoming an Outdoors Woman program started with a one-day workshop at the University of Wisconsin in 1990. And its objective was to identify the barriers that keep women from participating in outdoor activities and to find ways to address those barriers. One of the major barriers identified was a lack of opportunity for women to learn outdoor skills in a non-threatening, comfortable environment. This led to the development of the first Becoming an Outdoors Woman multi-course weekend workshop in 1991. Affectionately known as Bo, there are now over 80 workshops offered in more than 40 states, several Canadian provinces, and New Zealand. Over 20,000 women participate in Bo events every year. I had come to one before, and I come from a city background, and I wanted to learn how to do outdoor things, and when I come to Bo, I meet young women, old women, married women, single women, and it's just a great place to be. Arizona Game and Fish, the Arizona Wildlife Federation, and Safari Club International are all supporters of Bo. They assist in offering a wide range of courses to help give women the confidence to take part in whatever level of outdoor recreation they're comfortable with. We offer stuff that to get you comfortable. You know, you could do, um, I'm lost now what? That's actually a class that we do. You're already lost. We're not teaching you how 
to not get lost, what do you do when you get lost? Another one that they like to do is wilderness medicine because they're afraid what happens if I get hurt. So that's a very popular class for the first time. You want to point the rod where you want the lure to go and let it go there. While all of the participants are women over the age of 18, Bo is not a man-free zone. Many of the instructors are men who are experts in their field. I really enjoy taking pe people fishing that have not done it before or have forgotten how much fun it is and giving them a chance to catch a lot of fish. It's, uh, it's not the goal of it to catch fish, but it is to have the experience. And, and the people that come here seem to really enjoy that. This is the eye of the hook. This is where the, um, the, the leader is attached to, to run up to my, my fly rod. This is called the shank of the hook. This is the bend of the hook. And this is the pointy part. <laughs> <laughs> the bow instructors are all volunteers who bring a wealth of experience to the camp, and they all seem to have mastered the formula that makes learning fun. That's going to make your experience out there when we start playing the serious I'm going to tackle you water games, you're going to beat everybody if you become one with the boat. And that happens with all the instructors. When I first started doing this, I'm like, what is wrong with these instructors? I mean, are they nuts? I mean, they're giving up their time. Nobody gets paid. You know, they're giving up their time. They're giving up their knowledge to teach a bunch of women how to fish or pop a balloon with an arrow. But. I found out and I started writing it, as a matter of fact, I started writing it up and then I says, you know, when you start writing a story and it grows, it, it came back on me. I'm like, you know what, the instructors are getting as much back, if not more, from the students and that's what happens. Yeah, it's very cool. These weekends offer over a dozen different classes that participants can sign up for. Everything from backpacking to Dutch oven cooking to hunter education to rappelling and much, much more. Look over your shoulder. Awesome. You're almost there. <laughs> She's like, oh. Oh my God. I've always heard about it. I've always been an outdoors person, but there seem to be so many more other activities that I've never tried before, repelling, and I don't know how to use a GPS unit. So the, all these uh, worked into being on the coming to the bow. Evening events that feature wild game tasting are another way to introduce women to something most have never tried before. The fact that it's also combined with some wine tasting may make the elk stew seem a little less scary. Arizona coordinator Linda Deitman has been with the program almost since its beginning. No, seems like it though. Uh, I started at the turn of the century. <laughs> 2000 was my first camp here and I came up as a instructor. I did the game taste and I think I taught hunting class and then I just got involved in it and it, what it does is sucks you in because these ladies they want to be here, they want to learn and it totally sucks you in and it's so much fun and it's like giving back for me. I mean I've been outdoors my whole life and it's so fun to show these ladies hey our state has so many wonderful opportunities that uh, it's so much fun to share that with them. At the end of the weekend, the objective is not necessarily to turn the women into hunters or anglers, but to allow them to venture into Arizona's great wild places with a new sense of confidence and knowledge to pursue their own outdoor adventures. Right. Woo -hoo! Yeah. April 12, 2013, that's the day life became a lot more interesting for Eddie Wilcoxon. He was at Bartlett Lake asleep on his boat when something woke him up at around 2 a.m. I heard this click, 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 click. That noise was his fishing reel, and it was the sound of something big a flathead catfish large enough to swallow the two-pound carp he was using for bait. So Ed grabbed his pole and set the hook. When I set it, I went, oh my God, this was a pig, because I could, you know, I've caught enough big ones. I know when I set that rod, and that thing just, whoa, just locked. I said, whoa, that didn't move. More than a half hour later, Ed finally won his battle with a powerful flathead catfish. I drug him on the front of the boat and I just kept dragging and kept dragging. I'm like, oh my God, what is this? 
biggest fish I've ever had on a boat. I know it was. Turns out he was right. It weighed 76.54 pounds, making it the heaviest fish ever caught in Arizona. People don't understand how big this fish actually was unless you see it. You're like, no, that's not real. That's it. It was real. But sometimes it feels like a dream to the man known as Flathead Ed, who makes his living as a plumber but would rather be a fishing guide. I got my guide license April 1st, and God blessed me with this fish on April 12th. <laughs> That's just how it went. Everything else has just been crazy. Ever since he caught that record fish, Ed's been getting a lot of attention. People that are producing Duck Dynasty wanted me to do a little video for them, man. I guess they're, they're searching out rednecks in America. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Calls are coming in from all over the world and his guide business is beginning to boom. I probably get 25 phone calls a day just people asking me what to do and how to do it. Are there any more big catfish like that one out here? Oh yeah. People like Nick Walter, who authors the Arizona Game and Fish Department's weekly fishing report. Yeah, I, know there's, I know there's bigger ones out here. Nick was certain his readers would have plenty of questions for Ed. So he arranged an interview out on Ed's boat during a day of fishing on Lake Pleasant. You should take me fishing a lot, I like it. It was a special day for Ed because he was spending it with his grandkids who were visiting from North Carolina. Nine-year-old Devin had been fishing with his grandpa before, but this was a first for seven-year-old Cadence. They'd both seen the photos of their grandpa's mammoth fish and they couldn't wait for him to show them how to catch one. First, they'd have to catch some bait. So Ed pointed his boat toward the spot where they'd get started and on the way, he takes some time to talk with Nick. <laughs> so what's the minimum you need to go after some monster flathead catfish? I wouldn't go any less than 50 pound braid and uh, good hooks. Mm -hmm. Now, do you need a mustache like this to get flathead? It helps, it helps. Yeah. I, I've noticed it helps. Yeah. <laughs> We're selling those. <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, you got to grow them. <laughs> but no, it, uh, it, you know, just big gear, big gear, because you're gonna, un you're underestimate these guys. Mm -hmm. I use a Kuma 45D convector reels. Uh, they got a hell of a drag system on them, and and if you try to muscle these guys in, they're gonna break you off at a hundred pound line. So you've got to play them in. Big baits, right? Oh yeah, five pound carp ain't too big. It's not a chicken liver fish. You don't catch them with chicken liver. I mean, you can on, on an occasion, but they're a live bait fish, so you have to learn. It, it teaches the kids and everybody that fishes them, it teaches you how to catch bait, and now you can learn how to use the bait to catch your fish. So it's, you're actually doing two kinds of fishing. You're catching bluegill, you're catching carp. That's your bait. You use that bait to catch your fish. All right, kids, let's get some gill. Get some a quiet bait. cove is the perfect place to start. As soon as he hits that, the weight moves, and then the bobber moves. Once you start seeing it get hit. Ed shows his grandkids how to catch the small bluegill that they'll use for bait later tonight when they're going after the flathead catfish. Right there. Now you watch that bobber. As soon as that starts going down a little bit, it'll start going down. We got a couple. You want to see? Friends stop by to say hi and join in on the fun. <laughs> Bam, got you. There's plenty of hits. That's a good one. You got one, you got one. one. And misses. And then let him go. You're practicing catch it rapid release. As daylight starts to fade, the race is on. Oh, that's got to be one right there. To get more bait fish into Ed's live well before it gets dark. Look at there. Bam. Get him, Devin, get him. And with that, they should have just enough bluegill to last until morning. So Ed starts his boat and begins searching for a place to spend the night. On the way, Ed stops to say hello to Flat Cat Dave, who's also known as the mayor of Bartlett Lake. Ed says he and Dave are part of a tight community of folks he calls flatters. They spend much of their lives on the water in pursuit of flathead catfish, and they care deeply for Arizona's fisheries. Yeah, great people. This is what we enjoy doing. We practice CPR. I got a lot of pictures. Ed explains that CPR stands for catch, photograph, and release. <laughs> no mouth to mouth. <laughs> it's their contribution to conservation. Catch and release. Don't take everything home you got. 
Put it some back. Don't take it all. Let other people catch it. After Ed anchors his boat along a rocky shoreline, he selects a rod from his impressive collection and starts to show his grandkids how to prep the line. Whoa, that's a good one. Ed knows a trick or two when it comes to catching flats. After hooking a small bluegill to the end of his line, he lets it splash around near the surface of the water for several minutes before lowering it deeper into the lake. And it's just like varmint calling. Ed says that sound of a fish in distress is like ringing the dinner bell for flatheads. Hallelujah. But quite often the fish don't come to dinner until everyone's sound asleep. You hear that sound tonight? It's out of bed, Fred. So that's our cue to say goodbye to Ed, Devin, and Cadence. Why are you good fishermen? I'm blessed by the best. Give them a chance to spend some family time before the soothing waves of Lake Pleasant gently rock them all to sleep. Where they can dream of catching another record flathead catfish or wake up to the sound of a dream come true. Ah, oh, I live for it. Well, that's our show for today. For more information, check out our website at azgfd.gov. For all the fine folks at Arizona Game and Fish, I'm Jim Paxson. We'll see you next time.